Welcome to the Author Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. I'm Mac. And this is our podcast about anything and everything off road. As always, we're socially distanced. It's literally the only way we've ever done the show. Um, we started before the pandemic on a video call, and that's the way we've left it. Yep. Yeah, uh, so I'm in the Midwest. Today. Yeah, I'm in the Midwest, Ross in the Northeast, and Max on the West Coast. So we're back to all of the time zones. Mm-hmm. Yep. Got to rip. And daylight rip. savings time, too. Oh, God. Yeah. First <laughs> couple of days of 5 p.m. sunsets. It's, uh, we're planning a camping trip this weekend. It's already, I'm just like, okay, we got to, oh, God, we got to get there by four or else it's going to be yes. a nightmare. Up and moving by about 630. And uh, oh, yeah, the, the fire's on by 530. Or yep. making sure you have the ability to set up camp in the dark, like take extra lights. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that sucks. Ross, uh, this was lanterns. your first one with a kid. Did did she do any different for daylight savings time? I am extremely happy to say, and very skeptical of actually putting it out there into the world, but totally fine. Totally mm-hmm. okay. So no as issues. she ages up, um, as as the way I like to say, get older, like level up, age up. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Power shitty up. part, yeah, the shitty part about fall back is your kids wake up earlier. So like they don't know it's a time change. So when they're toddlers, they just still naturally wake up at their circadian rhythm. Mm-hmm. So where she normally would get up at six, she got up at five that morning. So okay, um, her parents, uh, daylight saving time is absolutely the absolutely two worst days of the entire <laughs> year. <laughs> because lose lose it's yeah, not it's lose, lose, so yeah lose, there's lose, no like yeah. oh people are like oh we gain an hour no your toddler wakes up an hour earlier like there's <laughs> nothing yeah yeah so well, cross that bridge when we get there yeah so you want to talk about your dx yeah speaking of bridges that we have finally crossed uh <laughs> light force light force sent me lights to test like six months ago um if if not more and i i feel terrible about it uh but the you know the stars never really aligned and i i had them on the truck and they weren't wired like we tried to wire them we could only get them into low power mode um so yesterday i went down to the custom shop in astoria in queens and brett and the guys at the custom shop uh wired up the lights got them going and uh yeah we are fully functional with the light force lights and they are uh it literally turns nighttime into daytime it's like they're not legal for use you know in normal traffic conditions and it is like every bit of that is understandable um it is it's truly like mesmerizing how far lights have come because i put a set of hella 500s on it which you know are like the gold standard for cheap rally lights Mm -hmm. and then you know talk to life force and life force was super kind and sent these over so we are functional um yellow filters you know i've had them on the whole time they look awesome in my opinion because rally lights should always be yellow if not covered with a white cover um and yeah so they should be good for like dust and nighttime adventures and snow which is a thing that is you know unfortunately imminent and yeah so got those wired up properly um and we fixed the hyper flash problem in the turn signals on the bumper too, which has been going on since the bumper went on because the turn signals are LEDs and the original turn signals are halogens. So it turns into like hyper flash issue. So they put a resistor in and sorted that out um, and we got it aligned and now it drives track straight for the first time since <laughs> there may or may not have been an incident with a rock. Oh. Um, yeah. Have I seen video of this rock or is this just like random rocks? No, this was this was on a trip when it was still cold. Okay. <laughs> so it's been, it's this been was six, in, six to eight months. Uh, it was in March. <laughs> but there's no good alignment shops near me. Like the only place in Stanford to get an alignment is Firestone, which like you can do the lifetime yeah. alignment for 149, but you have to go back two days later because they never get it right. Yeah, I oh. <laughs> my truck just got aligned at a Firestone, and uh, condolences. It, yeah, it's I don't know how much of it is just GMT eight hundred like sloppy quality, but like it tracks straight, but the steering wheel still isn't perfectly straight. So I don't mm. know. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I want to talk more about the eight hundred as we get yeah, into we'll into your stuff because yep. because I've had two eight hundreds, Chris has had eight hundreds, like 
they're they're uh, rampant in the off road world apparently. Yeah. So to um, complete the trifecta real fast, I literally had the suburban out of Firestone today. <laughs> yeah. Incredible, Gold. messy with a lineup. Gold. <laughs> Gold. So uh, so yeah, so I went down to Queens and and uh, you know the guys at the custom shop. I mean the stuff they're doing. Like, you know, my, my truck's in there and I'm looking around and like, this is the least interesting vehicle on the premises at the moment. You know, they got suspension on the floor for a 944 turbo that they're lifting after my truck leaves. You know, Mm -hmm. there's an R8 in for stuff. And that's the thing about New York car culture. It feels like most people don't do it, but the people who do it go out. Like, oh yeah. Wildest stuff out there. Yep. There's a, it's the nature of the like oh, tri-state nice. area surrounding New York City where mm-hmm. in order to be part of this, you have to like be in the deep end of the pool. You know, yep. there is no shallow end because no. like, because it it either compromises your ability to drive a car in the city, mm-hmm. which is, you know, like a Prius is the perfect car for that, or it, you know, is of extreme financial yep. intensiveness and sometimes both. <laughs> you yeah. know well and if you um, if you have a truck there versus a car you're paying an extra 170 a month oh, to, God, just to yeah. park like dude i i i can't imagine i mean i live in connecticut and like you know we i'm privileged with a driveway but like down there i know people that are paying 500 bucks a month just to park yeah no so was in brooklyn and it was like 260 and my friends was 300 before the pandemic she left during the pandemic came back it was 550 a month Oh my god. No, thank you. No, yeah, thank, yeah no, that's crazy. It's that's just the and, and you gotta call them an hour before to tell them, hey, I'm coming to pick it up. Right. It'll we be, have to it'll un- be on a stack stack your on cars. Oh yeah. 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 So uh yeah, so that's the Lexus update. Um contemplating selling it. It's technically for sale. Uh, after spending, you know, the last like week working on it and and having the shop work on it, you know, I'm like. Oh God, I really like this truck. Like if it wasn't black, I would probably never have even thought about getting rid of it. Um, but I just have like a, a, a problem with black vehicles as it, it turns out. And are, so are you, are you a person that always sells cars quickly or do you yes. usually give, okay. All right, yeah, yeah. Same. Oh yeah. yeah. My brain's um, super broken. I had the Lexus for a year as of Halloween which okay. is long. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's about the top end of my ownership ever. A year? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that that Miata that just flashed across the screen was 60 days. Oh, God. So, it was yeah. more than that. Uh, I had a Mazda 3 for four days. <laughs> four? Yeah. Uh, I, did, I, I bought it as an in-between in a, in a bartering system that I was working on. doesn't <laughs> matter. But I traded from a Lincoln Town Car up to a Miata. It was the worst Miata in the world, but it was still a Miata. Depending on the town car, that might have been a lateral move. Yeah, well, it had a cracked head. Okay, so the Miata, the Miata had a horrible bass boat paint and like oh, a terrible no. aftermarket shifter and Altezas. Like it was so bad, and I crashed it within twenty four hours. Of nice. It was an NA or NB? Yeah, NA. NA. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, NAs are in. There's three states of existence for NAs. There's pristine. Yeah. There is absolute like you know trash and then there's yep. like it's still alive it doesn't look good but it's still alive yeah so i can find you guys a picture of this seems like you'll appreciate it but anyway go on yeah oh, so so that's all the lexus updates um i do real quick uh this is sort of a plug but also not sort of a plug um a little while ago pelican sent over a cooler and a flashlight to test Ooh. Ooh. Uh, for the off-roading trips and the utv trips so they sent over the 8060 flashlight Mm -hmm. and i've been playing with it and it's like rechargeable you know and it's um it has five selectable programs of which i can only figure out (laughs) two of them (laughs) uh fill full kill and flashing like a strobe but it's uh it's a it's a nice little but nice little flashlight here and i thought it was i I thought it was going to be about the size of the actual head. And it turns out it's like mag light size. So I bought some Amazon, uh, you know, 799 mounts and I'm going to mount it up somewhere in the truck. Nice. But, yeah. Thank you, Pelican. And uh, yep. I 
owe them a review. <laughs> like a yeah, you review. Do. Yeah, it's over. Well, there. sweet. I'll recap my so, uh, yeah. latest trip super fast. I borrowed a van, borrowed another adventure van. Um, so it's a Ford Transit, high roof, extra long van, um, all wheel drive, uh, Toyo Open Country AT3s. It's got a Quigley Q lift on it, which is a two inch body lift. Um, and then they do some Bilstein's up front and some Fox shocks in the rear. Are they like... C or E rated LT3? Uh, They're LT3s. E's. They're three. Which Threes? one's higher? Should really borrow that disco that's in the background. So that's my buddy Ron. Um, and so Ron and I kind of did a, a little tour of central Kansas. And so we met we met at this place that's called Coronado Heights, which is hilarious because there are no heights in Kansas. <laughs> it's just <laughs> this is a hill. Um, and what this is is like this was during it was built in like 1936, I think. And it's one of those little little um public works projects during the like the the new deal of like coming trying to come out mm -hmm. of the great depression so they literally paid people to build this thing here um and i didn't, um, I didn't take any pictures of the inside because like you go in here it's one big room and there's uh like an l shape of two giant cement tables that they have uh constructed in the middle of it and it's huh. got giant wood rafters and that's it like <laughs> i don't okay. When you when you're trying to find jobs for people, this is what they came up with. Um, so I met Ron here, and then we just kind of did some we did some touring through Central Kansas a little bit. Um, basically, started south of Topeka and got down near to Wichita. Um, it was it, we we basically were like it was the first weekend where I didn't have youth sports, and so mm -hmm. it was like Youths? how yeah the, that those those will ruin your schedule. So um, <laughs> I like watching them play them, but like it, you really don't get to do much. Um, but we did also, we stopped at the Kansas motorcycle museum. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, I'm not even a motorcycle guy, but um, Ross, I got a bunch of like vintage motorcycle photos to send you later. Cool. <laughs> um, I am here for it. As the yeah, kids say. exactly. So we did, we ended up just kind of turning around. We went to a couple different places. We went to a game refuge. We saw bison. Um, I feel like that's kind of uh, trite for me being from Kansas to, to <laughs> see bison. Um, and eventually ended up at one of Ron's friends' farmland. So it was like their family farmland. I think it's 100 plus acres. But we just kind of hung out. And while we were there, then like a couple other guys showed up with their rigs. And so um, I got I to gotta think about how to pronounce his name. Yop. Um, Yap is Dutch, but he showed up in his 100 series. And so um, at the farmland, they basically had this dry creek bed that was running through. And so we kind of went through wow. and started clearing out brush and basically set it up so Ron could run the Defender through, or the Defender. Mm -hmm. Ron could run his Discovery through. Yap could run his 100 series through. And then we kept trying to uh, convince Ryan to run his Raptor through. Mm -hmm. He's like, no, it's a new truck. I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, it was a very good idea that he didn't do that. So um, it looks we, like it got a little spicy, a little fast. It the so right. So this was Saturday. Friday, we had two plus inches of rain. Um, and so even with a dry <laughs> creek bed, it was no longer a dry creek bed. And so like you yeah. can't really see in this picture, but this rut here is about 12 inches deep. And that mm -hmm. was Yap was the first guy through. So like it it did get spicy quick. Um, both rigs had winches. Both winches were used. Um, what's he do? Yeah, it was it, it. It's sad to say, like, I felt left out because <laughs> I was in the adventure van. So like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's got all wheel drive. But like everything they were doing, there was no way the van was going to be able to do any of that stuff. And just yeah. yeah. As soon as you start to get off camber and it's something that high, like even with the dually axle on the back, like it was just like, mm -mm. like I will tell you, like I slept great. It's got a, a gasoline powered <laughs> furnace in it. So it was like 72 degrees all night. Slept with my blanket, my pillow, the boy. Luxury just, living. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I took two of my, two of my boys with me and they, they had a great time. And so yeah. it was, it was nice, but like, and very, very quickly made me yearn for a trail rig again. So um i don't think the suburban's going to be modified into that but uh, we're gonna have to start looking for like a budget bill which is very apt to have mac on tonight uh to <laughs> then start talking because literally you uh, had experience okay. with two vehicles that have been fairly prevalent in my life so 100 series and gt 800 yeah. so yeah. <laughs> uh yeah that's my update i'm done let's get out of here cool 
So Mac Mac did send me uh, his Miata. Oh, yeah. oh, nice. Okay. Well, I mean, first things first, Mac. Why don't you introduce yourself? Give us your quick little elevator pitch, as sure. they, as I say. Oh my yeah, gosh! So, you think this is the worst Miata? Sorry. Oh, I mean, I'm completely just, interrupted. <laughs> if you had seen all the, it's, it was rusty underneath. Okay. It did not idle properly. The AC didn't work. The uh, yeah, the idle would just like go like crazy all the time. Um, horrible aftermarket exhaust. Horrible aftermarket outsides. Mm. Um, shook violently at many different speeds. Ah. Um, so just, instead, of, instead of being like a you know like the ten footer thing where yeah. like it looks great from. 10 feet away at 10 miles per hour. This might be like a yeah. 50 footer. Yeah. The closer you got, the worse it got for sure. Um, and like, just like the hood just visibly didn't line up. Um, yeah, and I can see the gap. Yeah, yeah. You can see it from that angle. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. But um, I actually, I traded for that car in the middle of January in Columbus, Ohio, while I was at college. And I, I just found out I was getting the Jalopnik internship. Ooh. And so I drove directly to the Detroit show like 20 hours after buying this car okay. and ran into a snowstorm on these rural uh, highways in like Ohio with like 70 miles an hour speed limits and just like trucks are whizzing by me. It's not a good look. And <laughs> uh, at one point, like I have to get over in the left lane. And then as I'm trying to get back in the right lane, I hit a bank of snow and just the thing pirouettes. <laughs> oh, and I go, <laughs> it's one of those like deep V um sort of in medians because it's mm. not like a full interstate and so i go in i've end up backwards at the bottom of this median and the, like i get out and i'm like this thing's totaled i've blown it like i had changed it on my insurance so it was fine but i was just looking at it and i was like ah oh, this is so bad i get out not a scratch the car is completely fine <laughs> not that i would have noticed a new scratch uh. Uh, but now i i'm on like shitty all seasons in the bottom of a ditch and i <laughs> I, I can't get it out because it's a giant right. shape and the car just won't do it. So I'm pushing and this truck like pulls up to stop and he quickly realizes like he doesn't have ropes. There's nothing he can do yeah, about he's it. And he's like, too. Yeah. And he's like, uh, watch out. Cause if the highway patrol gets you, they'll, they'll cite you for loss of control of the vehicle. I was like, Oh shit, I can't, I'm in college. I can't afford that. Um, and so I call my insurance company. They're like, yeah, it's going to take an hour and a half to the truck to get there. And I see this Civic stop at the intersection up the road. And it's like, it's a 70 mile an hour highway, but there's little onlets onto it for like, because mm -hmm. it's super rural. And these guys, this, I see this guy get out. It's 25 degrees, but he's in Ohio. So of course he's wearing shorts. And a, 75. Like in a Ohio. Light, yeah. Yeah. And a light hoodie. And his girlfriend gets out with him and they come running. They sprint across two lanes of traffic plus the emergency lanes in a snowstorm in Ohio, seeing a car crash. And he comes trudging through the six inches of snow that is done at the bottom. And he walks up and he's like, dude, I own a Miata too. We don't leave a man behind. <laughs> <laughs> no soldier girlfriend. left behind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> him and his girlfriend and another kind stranger who stopped with enough uh, rocking, he was driving the car and I was helping push and we got the oh we got God. it back over the ridge and I made it to Detroit. That, Dude, that's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Did, so presumably the roof was actually functional. <laughs> the, yeah, the roof worked, thank God. But on the no, way no, back, no, I'm, I'm picturing like, convertible down. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that was my first off-roading experience. <laughs> ah, yes. Very Maybe, unintentional. Mainly because that's the only way I fit in a Miata is the top has to be down. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right, man. Oh. So what, what was your, uh, how did you end up going from Miata to 100 series? Oh, God. Uh, long story. So, um, And there's a, presumably a few years between these. So. Many. Yeah. Oh, also, did I do my introduction, by the way? I'm no. Back. Yeah. <laughs> I am... Matt Hogan, reviews editor at Road and Track. You should get that out of the way before. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, I go on a lot of tangents. Um, yes, but uh, so how did I get there? So I got rid of, okay, so I had the town car, which I traded for a Mazda 3, which I traded for the Miata, and like 300 in cash changed that, but it was fine because the town car didn't run. And then I traded, I bought an Acura CL Type S, um, mm. which is, you know, sort of a weird, but I hadn't ever really heard of it, but it was, there's only like 3,300 manuals and I just found one for like three grand. And I was like, weird, right. weird looking cars. 
Yes. Yeah. And like, it's a Honda VTEC V6, but front wheel drive with an LSD yeah. and a manual. It was a cord weird... coupe in drag, basically. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, cool cars, and, actually. Yeah, it was actually pretty fun to drive. I liked it. But uh, I I was very busy and doing a bunch of like freelance writing. Accurate dealership to get its like airbag recall done. And I was just like, didn't pick it up for a month. Because <laughs> they, they called and were like, there's like a lot of subframe rust. And I'm like, ah, shit, I got to I gotta get it mm. of this. So mm. then I got an LS400. Then right. I moved to New York to work for a road track. So I sold that and thought I was done with cars. And then a month later, I uh, got an, a message from one of my coworkers. And this was at the start of the pandemic, like end of April. Um, okay. They're like, hey, my dad's selling an S2000. He put this in our general trade. Uh, Zach Bowman, who you guys know. Um, no, ah, he is my boss. Yes, I know. Yeah, I realized. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. Uh, I think I found uh, it. What? I think I found oh, it. The, oh, yeah. Yeah, that one. So uh, that was his dad's S2000. Oh, um, no shit. And this is the part that I didn't say publicly, but... So that was a 34,000 mile car in 2020. And oh he boy. puts in chat and goes, there was one big gash in the rocker panel, but it was two owners, maintenance records the whole time, no rust. He wanted eight grand for it. What? Oh like, my God. Is it I was AP1 like, or two? Uh, AP1. It was a 2001. Yeah, yeah. Eight um, grand? Oh my God. Yeah. 30 put a miles. Put a one or a two in front of it now. Yes, exact. So... I, uh, oh, even more, honestly, uh, because I, yeah, the license plate sand. Nice. <laughs> didn't make me send back, but uh, I had to keep that. <laughs> I had to register in Ohio because the New York DMV was still closed for like two months yeah. after that. Yeah, um, appointment only. Yep. But uh, anyway, the, uh, I had that car and that was like, I've always dreamed of owning one of those. That's like my favorite sports car and loved it, was having a great time with it. Um, but during the pandemic, you could like easily find street parking. So it was street parked. And, uh, oh my I moved to a new neighborhood that was one or two steps down. Um, and within a week it got oh, yanked God. off the street. Oh, um, heartbreaker. Yeah. Yes. This is, my memory is coming back right now. Yeah. I'm remembering this. <laughs> so I think I'm never going to see it again. I get a call that they found it, but it's all torn out. Like or I get a call they found it and they're like, I'm like, what's the condition of the car? They're like, we can't say that. I'm like, like, we can't, you know, provide an estimate or anything. And I'm like, just tell me one thing. Are the seats in the car? And the guy's like, no. And I'm like, it's gone. Yeah, like, that's done. it. Like, um, total. And so it's totaled. Oh, fucking beautiful. And yeah, it was the worst. But insurance ended out after some back and forth paying out and it was fine. So out of that, I went into a Boxster, mm -hmm. but I just didn't really care. It was a 986, like base model, five mm -hmm. speed. It was fine. Um, it Parsing. was like, yeah. it was good, but in like a kind of Porsche E way where it's like, oh, great. You made a good car, Porsche. Right. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it's so good. It's much. boring. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's like, is this better than a Miata or do I just get to say I own a Porsche like that? Mm. And we did a whole comparison <laughs> test with that. It was is it better than a Miata or am I just paying three times as much to change the oil? Yeah. And you, <laughs> you and also like constantly worrying that it might explode. Um, and the Ooh, worst yeah. thing about it is like the people that don't know anything about cars, it would be like, oh my God, you're out of your Honda and got a Porsche. That's so cool. And it's like, no, no, it's worse. You don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever tried to work something. on this engine no you haven't <laughs> God. um yeah so that didn't scratch the itch so then i got a 190,000 mile e39 m5 um which went about as well as you would assume that went mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and in a mm -hmm. panic as i was about to leave new york and needed something that could fit my stuff i straight traded that for my 190,000 mile 100 series lx um presumably in better running condition than a hundred ninety thousand mile yeah it was but as as becomes important later on it was rusty uh it was an east coast truck ah uh, uh, um but starts I with t and rhymes with toyota it's gonna rust yes um yeah so i bought that and uh literally within 10 hours of that photo being taken i had driven it back to new york loaded up my stuff and went set off back to cleveland so i drove it drove it like 300 miles north because I picked it up mm. in Maryland and then 500 miles back to Cleveland. And then a week later, back to New York, another 500 miles, oh, then geez. back to Cleveland, then across the country. Uh, was there any PPI or anything involved in this? Or this was just like going for it? 
buddy, I if that is a lesson I will simply <laughs> never learn. <laughs> uh, I, we, uh... <laughs> I'm a loose cannon cop who doesn't play by the rules. Let me tell yeah. you. <laughs> well done. <laughs> But yeah, uh, I, I definitely recommend PPIs to everyone. I yes. just, you know, yes. um, do as I say, not as I do. Hundred <laughs> percent. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. but yeah, that thing that it. Look at that. It was all the way up to the roof. Oh, Every God. single thing I could bring. I had to like leave a couple of lamps, and we hit like five national parks on my way to San Diego. Got here without a single fault. Um, but then I did like a shakedown Joshua Tree off roading trip in it because I hadn't taken it. Like I'd taken it camping probably four or five times. But I did like a proper offer. It's like 100 degrees out. My rusty ass truck that I already knew was not, you know, it, it, in the best of condition. And it was me and my buddy and a JK Wrangler, that exact buddy on the screen. And uh, was that that night? Uh, no, that was January. Um, and uh, so we did like a rock crawling trail in Joshua Tree that was, you know, had signs for idiots like us saying things like people have died on this trail don't do it when it's extremely <laughs> hot toes from this area cost one thousand plus dollars yeah that, those mm. fun things they put up mm. in park you will end up on the youtube channel yes and anyway we get like an hour and a half two hours in it's far past the point of no return and like my i i've raised the hc my truck is all the way up at like kind of max articulation and i just see the eats just a, a ton of black oil just go Oh, on the ground oh, like, no. and i'm like oh. oh and and it's like 45 to an hour of like rocks to get out and yeah. i'm like oh, God. oh shit yeah um, your heart just everything like right out your ass yeah yes um but not only did it make it the hour and a half to the campsite but then three hours back to get my friend back to her flight um <laughs> then 45 minutes to the uh what's it called uh toyota shop uh, like the specialty shop out here. Shout out San Diego Trucks. They're good and honest. Um, and they, the good, honest people told me, do not spend any more money on this truck. Oh, um, <laughs> so I listed it for sale. And then it decided to be a petty little bitch and uh, retaliated by vomiting its AHC fluid oh. all over the street <laughs> and immediately collapsing. Oh, so then yeah. it drove another 45 minutes with the suspension collapse. And the guy's like, I told you to sell it. Like, I was selling it. I had yeah, people coming yeah. to look at it that day. Mm. Um, like I was trying. I did what you said. <laughs> yes. So, of course, I'm sitting there trying to figure out what, what I'm going to do. And Jason Fenske messages me and goes, hey, man, he when I had first bought that M5, he had originally was trying to sell me this Miata. And I was like, I'm in mm. 100%. It's like a very good price, whatever. And then he ended up saying, no, I need to keep it for another year. And I'm like, all right, give me first fight or flight right of refusal when you sell it. And he messaged me. He's like, hey, I'll still honor that price from January 2021, which we all know is oh boy. Yeah. insane. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you want to come get it in a month. And I'm like, oh, shit. Now I like I can't I couldn't afford it without the Lexus. So the Lexus had to go. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then I drove that back from Seattle. And that's how I finally got to the point where I'm like, okay, this is amazing. And I need a car that can fit actual humans in it. So I bought the <laughs> $2,500 Tahoe that is now outside. Okay. So, oh. so first the Miata. So it's an ND1 or two. It's an ND1 with okay. a supercharger. Um, Edelbrock? An, an Edelbrock or... supercharger. Okay. Um, but so there's an Edelbrock carb legal tune mm -hmm. that goes on when we do emissions. And then there's a, a better Fab 9 tune that it lives with every day. Ah, yes. Yes. Fab nine. Yep. This, but is, this is the car that came with a laptop, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the Jason Derulo laptop. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so that thing's, I mean, it's, it's also 36,000 miles. I like an ND actually oh, better geez. than an S2000. So, and, and it's got a cool wrap on it um, that looks like paint, but it's an, a Miata and an actual color, which is, yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. Unlike, so it's, it's really unlike cool. what Mazda is unwilling to do it's a no, freaking color yeah we talk about this all that like it's the best sports uh, car for sure oh um, yeah going back down the coast in that car it was you know uh there's the whole thing about like you know you buy a supercar get it in like a dark blue or a dark red and if you buy like sure. a fiesta st get it in the psycho green or something right. like that you know yeah and yeah mazda should have i mean they're still making the nd so yeah, fucking get after it. But you know what's crazy to me about that though? 
I we we talked about these colors a lot in road and track slack because basically all we talk about is Miatas and old BMWs. And sounds uh, right, Travis. Yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> there's a reason the guy in charge is there. <laughs> yes. Um and uh you know what surprises me is I love my favorite color for any car is a dark green. I think it's like a dark green, mm-hmm. like old British rose or come on. And I've seen some people who have wrapped Miatas in dark green. And in my head, an ND Miata in dark green is like the Lord himself. I think it's, well, yeah. One plus but then one like I look two. up the pictures and I don't know if you've seen, like it doesn't half. actually look good. It's half. like, yeah. yeah, I don't know what's wrong with it, but like the proportions or something about, or like the aggressiveness of it, it just doesn't, it's not very subtle. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Agreed. But yellow works. We can yellow. decisively say that yellow works. And there are very few cars that yellow works on. I yeah. mean, Wranglers being one of them. But yeah. Well, what was so the um, 30th anniversary orange? That's amazing. Oh. So good. Oh, my God. I should have put a deposit down on one of those. I fucked I up. Know. We God. all should have. Because the other thing about it is like, I love my supercharged Miata. I'm not pumped positive that it's any better than just an nd2 nd2 yeah yeah (laughs) i know i know i i drove an nd2 i had one for a week like uh like two weeks before my kid was born and i was like yeah oh like yeah it's the whole chef's kiss it is they put an engine that makes you feel like it's a real engine in a miata that's all we've been asking for for 30 years yeah yeah it's yeah. oh my god, oh, it's, god it's, that color is so oh, freaking good. good yeah and they got the wheels right to match to it yeah. it's got the little like you know anniversary things on them yeah red brimbos god. every time we do like one of these road and track experience things where we invite a bunch of readers out to like you know whatever um everyone brings all their supercars or whatever and like mm-hmm. we tend to you know it's it's different experience levels not no one's like pushing anything and so I always end up just booking like one Miata to just like, <laughs> I, last time I was the chase car and just to like sweep up anyone who got lost or anything like that, this guy pops a tire and I end up sticking with him for a little bit or whatever. And then like 40 minutes goes by and I have to leave. And then mm-hmm. I have to try to catch up to the pack. And we're like all oh, the yeah. way back on these Texas back roads. And I have like a real motivating reason to be like, all right, let's go. And just <laughs> <laughs> driving a Miata yeah. as hard as, oh, Yeah, drive. but you, you were still like, you know, not anywhere near the level of insanity that you would be in a you know even yeah. like a fucking gt350 yeah but. and that's like i don't know i it's a weird thing about the supercharger is like I, it's silly because it's only i think it's 200 horsepower at the wheels which just isn't that much but it like it, it kind of is like we're all so desensitized to it but yeah, like yeah. when yeah. i'm up on like good canyon roads you know it's only a guy like pilot sport all seasons or something on it um but like 200 horsepower in a 2300 pound package is like you yeah. to feel the edge of grip you need to be moving like you're not you're not going like comfortable mm-hmm. if you see a cop speeds for sure mm-hmm. um and i'm sort of like I, you know i i think fast is pretty overrated in in the car world yeah we i mean shit we talk about that all the time you know the the actually going fast versus the feeling like you're going yeah. fast but yeah you know, there's the same reason I enjoy riding the quads more than I like the side by sides because you know, 30 on a quad feels like you're jeopardizing something. Yeah, 30 in a side. You by are. Side. Yep. There's case. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Trees. Whatever. Yeah. You know, hit a tree, you're yeah. in trouble, homie. At 30. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Well, don't hit a tree. As simple yeah. as that. But so, all right. So, um, yeah. so supercharge me out of generally good. Love it, yeah. Do with or without the supercharger. Um, let's talk about the the truck, the uh, okay. the budget, the, eight, the 800. Yeah, so yes. <laughs> so I had an 04 Tahoe Z71 with barn doors, and it was awesome. And I also mm. had an Avalanche, and it was awesome. <sighs> and I know Chris has had a couple of 800s. I had yeah. a, Are I the had Avalanches a as good as the rest of them? <clears throat> um, Ross it's, would tell you it's better. I so I, I mean. <laughs> As you probably do, I, I have an affinity for strange vehicles. Okay, yeah. He's also owned a Veracross Mac. We should we should oh, get Veracross. that on the table. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, it's okay. I was. What's the other? Oh, what's the weird Suzuki thing? Um, the Axiom Amigo. 
No, no. X90. I saw X90. X90. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want one of those. But that was a tracker. Oh my God. That was a you, tracker. Hold on, hold on. Do you actually want one of those? Because I will send you the best one. <laughs> I can't afford it, Mac. I can't. Okay, no, because I, I found one for like you three can't grand. You can't fit in it either, Chris. It's a manual for three grand, and it's got like 100,000 miles on it. And like, it's California. There's no rust. Oh, it has, uh, is it like purple? Recently, it has to be purple. purple. No, it's got to be like crazy. Uh, it's black. The crazy 90s part. interior. There was yeah. recently one that had a three-inch lift, and a three-inch lift, only next to you 31s oh, and it was, it was like oh boy this is a, an absolute nightmare okay like um, the colors on them were so great One hundred two thousand miles five speed clean the seats don't match but that's whatever yeah. it, it's a good time to get in the x90s okay look in uh, san diego craigslist if you're interested uh, uh, so the the radwood effect will hit on the x90s well, well see well, do you guys know davis adams no do not okay you guys should know Davis Adams because he has currently a GMT 800 and a GX 460. The GX 460 is the overlanding one, the um, whatever, the GMT 800 okay. is like the towing one, whatever. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but he's a former Honda PR guy, now a Firestone PR guy. Okay. Um, so good to know because he likes to send, you know, but yep. he bought one of these pre sort of Radwood effect and like sold it on auction site for like, a ridiculous profit because no one cared I'm about sure. these cars like two three years ago and now it's like what is that weird thing with the twist wheels see yeah. that's where oh, no, i am it's... i'm old enough to have remembered these when they came out i was in high school when these came out mm-hmm. and i it, there was like a run of small suvs like this like suzuki wasn't the yeah. only one mm-hmm. um but then the, i i God, I don't even know how many years ago, going into Rocky Mountain National Park in the park ranger oh, parking man. lot was a purple X90. Hell yeah. And okay. it has stuck in my brain forever just seeing this X90. Did it have the, the yeah. green, pink, and lighter purple jazz decal across the side? It did not. It was just pure oh, purple. I remember those. Yeah. I remember those. Also, um, so the rear end of it looks exactly like the contemporary Honda Civic. Have you ever thought, like, it's uncanny it's just like <laughs> slightly stretched yeah <laughs> it's like it, it's uncanny i don't know oh, man. Right. new civic good yeah. new civic is good yeah. new we'll civic, um anyways avalanche amazing avalanche yes. is best it rides like, like a suburban um the modularity of the midgate and the three yeah. panels across the back that you can take off in any order you want and leave on in any order you want yeah. so if you have like a weird thing that just sticks up in the middle you know yeah. like a barbecue you know that's pretty great yeah you just do whatever you want with it and uh yeah just awesome trucks what do they so, give up versus like the silverados like is it do they have different oh, rear suspensions different i don't know, uh, I don't know what I mean, well i think contemporary silverados were still solid front axle it could be wrong uh, so it's a so it's a 1500 chassis yep. i mean there was a 2500 but it's a, it's basically yep. a suburban with the back lobbed off yep Versus, Interesting. you know, like the Silverado's definitely had a beefier everything. There um, are and Carvana there. is selling 2013 Avalanche for 34 grand. Is it a oh, black God. diamond? Because if it's a black diamond, it's a, one of the last ones, and it is oh, worth. It's gonna be it, worth it, money. It is a black diamond. Mm-hmm. I can't so believe I, there's a big I know, Avalanche crowd that that's. I know more about these than anybody yeah. with a normal brain should. Ross, I, I know where one exists too. I may, I may. A black diamond? Who has a black diamond? Well, I would like to know this person. Yeah, I will um, connect you just in case he ever wants to get rid of it. He I also love, has a sweet K5 man. blazer. See, I'm a like, GM trucks person, but it's like a one month old thing. So I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I can't believe there are people that are uh, different levels of the avalanche. Like, that makes oh, perfect yeah, sense to dude. me. But like, I, I had one for. I think eight years. So, oh my god! Yeah, I mean, that's the only I mean, cool. only thing I've owned for more than I owned a quad for eight years, and I, or yeah. for ten years, and I owned, I owned that truck for eight years, and, and nothing yeah. else I've had for more than two. So it's like a Ridgeline if it was built by Chevy. And for people that don't understand that, that's better. We got a lot to teach you. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I'll def- I'll defend the Ridgeline. The Ridgeline's a, it's a good vehicle. It's not a no, no, I agree. Per Except yeah, for when you try to load a quad in the back of it. Oh, that went fucking terribly. Yeah, yeah no, we we won't we don't talk about that anymore. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't talk about that because it's all yes. Awesome Instagram. So the new I, I Silverado. Oh, sorry. No, the new Silverado EV is like as close to an avalanche as we're gonna get ever again. So yeah, 
Interesting. Anyways, tell us about your 800. Yeah. So um, a big part of why I wanted to get this too is like, I don't know. I feel in the enthusiast side of things, I feel a little guilty almost recommending like, oh, you should spend $50,000 on this like overlanding rig when like yes. I, I would, I, I, I'm in a very lucky position and I just, I, that's not even within reach of me. Like I'm not going to be building a, you know, I've reviewed $200,000 rigs and they're cool, but like, there's one thing being able to afford that, but imagine being able to afford to scratch that, right? Like that's just not, realistic oh, yeah. for you're in so. my brain from last weekend <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah right um and like that was something i started having a lot more fun with my uh lexus when i decided okay paint's a lost cause i'm not gonna mm -hmm. I, whether or not i scratch the paint doesn't matter and like okay 150 percent more trails just opened up to you if you're not thinking about that oh right? yeah mm -hmm. um so i wanted to sort of say i want to i want to do adventures without needing all of the crazy money and a big part of it was just looking at like what i actually need um and i think because we're car people and car world is dominated by marketing we all i think we overthink the products we use and we underthink how we use them um and like i see a lot of people in san diego with eighty thousand dollar overlanding rigs and i don't see many of them with mud on them uh, or, 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 or brush scratches or yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I see, say is that because it doesn't rain <laughs> well, that's part. it's been raining for like three days i mean i'm getting scammed but um <laughs> on uh, a refund yeah honestly but uh, uh you know we have this part of like all these people i know where like you'll be at a, a campsite in a, a developed campsite with power in a national park or something and you see a guy in a hundred thousand dollar land cruiser build who's parked at a campsite. And it's like, well, what do we, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously that the, I'm painting with the broad. Brush, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Small cross section and all that. Right. Um, but because we are so focused on the product, we tend to assume a level of scarcity that like a, a market creates, right? Like, of course, you're curious what the crazy $200,000 off-road experience is like. You can experience it. Um, and that scarcity kind of bleeds into the experience of, what the best overlanding trip is, right? Because if you want to do the best sports car experience, you got to spend all this money on track days and all this, you got to get crazy insurance and all these other things. And mm -hmm. we're used to mm -hmm. sort of having to buy our way to the Or top. fly to Germany. Exactly. And with overlanding, the one thing I've really realized since I moved out West is like, if you want to get far, far, so far away from people, you can't, um, you know, even see another person. And you want to, uh, see a, a part of nature you've never seen with not a single building in sight. You can do that so easily. It's not even fun. It's just like if you have a a vehicle that has four wheel drive and more than eight inches of ground clearance, mm -hmm. most of this country is your oyster. Right? <laughs> like you, yeah, you, you otherwise have to like seek out the off-roading portion of it and go yes. so remote that you're prioritizing the act of going remote, not just. Yes. And that's not just problem. because you get to this point where you're like, okay, I can't do the craziest trail. Um, so I need a better rig. So you buy a better rig. And then the places close to you because they're not the world's most famous places for those things, unless you happen to live near it. Um, are probably not going to be a challenge for you anymore. So you have to go further away. And then you eventually conquer that. And once you are capable of doing that without really thinking about it, well, then you need a more capable vehicle. And you get to the point, like eventually you're going to get a place where the vehicle no longer works. And if you're talking about the sacrifice of getting out there, um, I think there's a lot more to be said for, you know, taking your cross track or whatever the hell it is, mm -hmm. loading your backpacks in the back, driving to a trailhead and then really getting out there for yeah, two hiking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And leaving yeah, yeah. the because at some point if you if you have temperature control and you have constant mobility with zero engine and you have infinite supplies of food, like what are you doing? Like is that right. Like that's the exact line of thought I think that ends with us back in hotels. Like, <laughs> yeah. Just, well yeah you start starving I mean, all your problems. We've talked about this too where I and I forget get for the life of me who it was that we had this conversation with but it's like vacationing ultimately just becomes relocating your current home life 
to somewhere right. else. And if you overland, like I'm all for Dometic, you know, I oh, have yeah. more friends than I can count that have fridges and yeah, all this so stuff. I freaking you know? love the thing so much. Yeah, I've, it, I've recently become convinced that that's worth it. I don't have one, but I want one. (laughs) But when you start to emulate the comfort of your home in the places you go away, like, I mean, that's what's so special about doing a lot of the stuff we love is that it's uncomfortable, you know? Of course. And it's the same thing. You know, I think that's part of why people often buy too much performance car. Um, It's (laughs) a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's an act of humility to say, I don't have the skills to exercise. Like you put me in a $200,000 overlanding rig. Like the fact that I am not good at recovering vehicles because I haven't done it much. Like mm-hmm. that that means that I'm the limiting factor in all of these oh, yeah. situations, right? Dude, um, C8 Corvette. I drove, I've had two press, <laughs> two press C8 Corvettes and yeah. I can't get anywhere near what they're capable of. I know, I yeah. No shame admitting that. I, I had this whole problem at performance car of the year this year because like, Last year, because I was under 25, I couldn't drive the Porsche press cars. Um, and so because That's of a that, thing. yes. Oh, it's been a thing. I started this job when I was 20 and almost every car company has a 21 requirement, but a couple have 25s and it was a whole thing. And that like for the like Audi and Porsche just wouldn't uh, like, they were the two Germans were like so hardcore about it. Whereas it doesn't matter. But last year I didn't, I wasn't a voting member. Um, so it was like, okay you know, I, I can sort of test out my limits without feeling like I have to push it. But now it's like, okay, here's a Lamborghini. You have to decide whether that's worth, like, if that is moving the supercar game forward. It's like, oh shit, I have to at least try, you know, to scratch mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. itch. Um, and, and so recognizing that you're not good enough to need better equipment, at, like, I think that's something we need to celebrate a little more. Like, yeah. I, you know, Travis has been carding since he was, 10 and you know yeah. raced an f1 gtr <laughs> and raced with bill auberlin on things and did oh. historic races and has blown up uh historic race cars and like he drives an nd2 miata because yeah. he's like yeah this is that's all you need and mm-hmm. in the same way with overlanding i'm, I'm sort of looking at it like i want to say a big another big limiting factor is like yeah if you have a great rig you can get really to crazy crazy remote places but what that takes is a ton a ton of time and yeah i don't have a ton of time yeah yeah yeah, and money and i you know often my outdoor adventures are three days and it's like well for that short of time like yeah i can sleep on the ground and i don't need a a fancy rig um and you know buying a twenty five hundred dollar truck is my way of saying like okay it's going to be an adventure because i got there like yeah Yeah. part of it um we made it back to tarmac yep yes but a truck that is perfectly reliable and brand new and is on 33s and has giant lifts it's like well at some point if you know you're going to be able to get there Mm -hmm. once again what are we doing here (laughs) yep yeah no i mean i mean we're we're like talking dichotomies here because i i have a you know it's a five-year-old truck but it's you know it's it's still relatively modern and it's on 33s and like the reason that i bought it is the reason a lot of people do which is like you are willing to put the money and time into it so that the yep. time you go away is like if the thing in the tiny piece of question in your mind about you know having some kind of reliability issue is just not there yeah um because uh, you know unfortunately the number of things that have gotten canceled over the last few years is like I, I I stopped counting the number of things, yeah. number of trips I I had to bag, you know. Yep. So it was like let's just eliminate that variable completely right. because prior to that it was you know it was uh, two hundred and thirty thousand mile forerunners or or in, yep. in the case of the one that I bought from Chris more than that, you know. Yep. And it was like there's always that piece of like what and when will something go wrong and disrupt this. Um, yeah but well and you need it like a a big thing for me is that if i had the money yeah like i think that's the right way to approach it because ultimately like the one thing you've got to stay at max if you're even the 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 least bit anxious is that reliability and ultimately mm -hmm. like 
you know, the LX was a, a not particularly good example, but that was the example I could afford. And right. from what I wanted to spend, if I want a really reliable, um, new-ish, capable platform, I'm I'm getting into stuff that's in the 160s, 170,000 mm-hmm. miles. And no matter how much, you know, there's only so much you can have, like, it's a level of like, would I get further away from a road than I could walk in a day and a half? <laughs> yeah, like that's right. gotta be part of the calculus, right? Yeah, and like for sure. how much willing of risk are you will or how much risk are you willing to put on the line? And like you work your way up the ladder because you know mm. how much it means to you. But until you get to that point, until you can look at a, a thing and say, This is the experience this car enables that I haven't been able to have yet, mm-hmm. that's what I think people aren't doing enough of, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, really being honest about what they're going to use it for. I mean, it's the same thing with the sports cars. Yep. It's the same thing across the automotive spectrum, you know, like car companies are really good at convincing us to buy new, better cars. Yeah. Is the experience you're going to get from a lucid that much better than the experience? Is it, is it eight times better what you're going to get from a bolt EV? Well, to be fair, if you buy the Lucid, a lot of your money goes directly to the Saudi government. So ah, if you're into that. Yeah, uh, I didn't know that one. <laughs> I, yeah, uh... isn't it great? Fun fact, if you Google Lucid Air reviews for the first like two pages, no one mentions that Lucid is uh, majority owned by the Sa- Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund. Ah, People well, just don't know that. <laughs> as an unashamed Formula One fan, I will bite my tongue. Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just, anyway, the point is, Again, our companies are good at convincing us <laughs> yeah. of their particular image yeah. and what they would like people to know. Um, but <laughs> I think it's just, it's hurting the the passion among all of it. Like, yeah. if you got to tell someone to spend $60,000, like you, you've, you've lost them, you know? Right. Like you got to- Well, perfect example. Speaking of getting swindled, rooftop tents are like the number one hottest commodity of the last three years. Yes. You know, meanwhile, you could damn well sleep in an 800 and- uh, I have more days than sleeping in 800s than I can count. So yeah. there's a rooftop tent sitting 10 feet from me. Uh, that oh, really? Yeah. Uh, 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 go fast campers was yeah, like, I had a feeling it was a go fast. Yeah. 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 They're canceling the whatever the super light or, you know, Ultra redesigning light. it or something. Oh, really? And oh, they're I was like, designing it to be that, a, like blew them up. Yeah. There's they're redesigning it just because I think. All of their other stuff is wholly made in America. And this has some textiles from China or something like mm. that. I don't, the, it, it was one of their early products and they're like, okay, we, we're mature enough to sort of I'm, change I'm, it up. I I'm think. sending Graham um, another email. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think but, Walker just put a super light on his Montero, no? What's his name? Uh, yes. Joel. Jeff? Yes. It's the same. The same program that Matt got his tent is how Jeff got his tent. Like it, oh, they were it actually, was, it was a thing. They were yeah, putting Joel. Um. Oh crap! I know him on Twitter. Um, Joel, comma a friend on Twitter. What that? Joel Johnson. Uh, Joel Johnson, former thank you. editorial director at Gizmodo Media or something. Put one on his uh nine nine one or sorry nine nine seven. Uh, oh that eleven. Yeah, yes. which is sick. That guy. He custom fab the rubric. Too, yeah. Is... Um, yeah. Hey, sorry, you can was... if you can haul skis and a and a you yeah. know small box on top of a. 911, then why can't she throw an RTT up there? Yeah, on a 911, I think it makes more sense because yeah, you can't sleep in it, sleep in it. But right. so I I have this tent and I I don't have crossbars for my truck right now, but also like you know, I'm classic, I'm sure you can relate since you change cars often. Uh dog chasing a car who doesn't know how to what to do when he catches it. Um, mm-hmm. which is like I really wanted a rooftop tent, and now there's one here, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> do I care? Like I was in Yellowstone. I the Go Fast Campers had a Maverick with a seven thousand dollar shell. Yeah, super cool build. Seventy five hundred. Um, it's pricey. Yeah. Um, uh uh-huh. But again, made in America, which and the company is cool. They like uh, we we looked at their factory and it's like everyone is making fifty grand or more a year wearing Bose headphones they provide and working thirty five hour weeks at a made in America. But I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. Yep. Yeah, um, they treat their people right. Yeah, but, um, you know, we were in Yellowstone and it was like 25 degrees. And I'm like, man, you know what the worst way to start your day out when it's freezing cold is? 
going down a fucking metal ladder. <laughs> <laughs> and then brushing snow off things, oh, landing God, in the no. Yeah. Yeah. Um and, and like, you know, oh, I just adjusted my chair by accident. Um I think if you're I think it's one of those again, yeah. honesty and capability, right? If you're out there 40 days a year, yeah, it's worth it. Sure. You're not gonna be something. Um but even for like, I've been out probably 30 days this year, not, you know, camping and like, I love good. it, but yeah, like, yeah, we, we always go to the same plot of land at the bottom of Joshua tree there. I'm actually going there this weekend, oh, um, nice. <laughs> but, um, you know, what I realized is like, okay, my ideal set for camping is four people. Um, cause I'm mostly going with my friends and just like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, getting a couple guys together. Um, and you know you're not going to get that in a rooftop tent uh and a tent that provides that is a hundred bucks like when you're with four guys you're not going to be it's not going to be that hard to set it up anyway um i mean a a good swag is like 75 right rei yeah Yeah. and you know it feels a little more and like then you can always store stuff on the top or you can sleep inside the truck um and again I, i really think the the story i want to tell about overlanding is that like screw overlanding and concept like take your car get as far away from people as you feel comfortable going and stay there like that's mm-hmm. what i believe in and if you tell someone again okay you got to spend thirty five hundred dollars on a tent they're going to look at you and say yeah out out of the casino yeah, <laughs> yeah and they didn't used to be that expensive like they started out like 1200 bucks or 1400 bucks yeah, for one i think and, this one's maybe 1500 i shouldn't say and everything. and they have i mean you know it's a it's the g-wagon mentality yeah. it's like the market dictates what it's worth and yeah. people are fucking buying these things up like yeah. like it's the only hobby they'll ever have for the rest of their life yeah you know? and, and i'm sure there's resale and part of it but i do wonder if we're all going to wake up and like 10 years be like for if you're spending enough time to need a rooftop tent in your car, there is a question of whether at that point you should be doing van life or something mm-hmm. more substantial, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and there are, you know, there's sort of hybrids. Like I wouldn't do it on a Maverick, but for 75 ish hundred, like uh, one of those GFC or one of those shell setups on a, on a pickup truck mm-hmm. where you have a pass through from the tent into the bed then you can stand yes. up. And that's a game changer, I think. It is. Right? You can cook in it if you, you need to. You can cook in it. If yeah, you know. change yeah. that kind right. of thing. Yep. Changing. big um Because changing yeah, in the backseat uh, of a... Oh, good. The power move is like a Tacoma SR trail with a GFC. You know, you're yeah. in it for like 40 grand and you don't need and to do don't. anything else. And neither part of that is going to depreciate, really. Or, um, or, or break. So, yes, <laughs> yeah um but you know it like that level of um rig is something that like i think it's a again you it's so easy to get a ground tent and it's so expensive to get a rooftop tent it's like if you can tell me what part of setting up your ground tent you hate and like what specific way that this is going to make your life easier i think that's mm-hmm. a good way to start but I, one thing I've been trying to teach teach myself with the equipment stuff, because it's so easy to fall down the rabbit hole of going overboard, is just like, okay, I can't say I need a more capable SUV. I can say I need a vehicle with better breakover. Like, I need to be able to do this trail. I need to be right, like, right. and until you can describe specifically what you want, I think it's so easy to just be like, okay, I can't even get out there until I have a $100,000 Land Cruiser. And that's not, right. that's not the message, right? Right. I mean, it's, so, it's, it's basic consumerism. It's like buying things because you can, yeah. and for the sake of buying them, you know, it's the same reason that somebody buys like the most expensive snowboard that they will, you know, be able to right. afford and, and run, you know, like bunny hills, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know? Well, but, and you think it'd be fun to say, oh, well, I'm in like the, the nicest rig or the nicest setup. And like, that's a little bit fun. Like when you're driving a $200,000 rig and people stop you and they're like, whoa, what is that? And they want to mm-hmm. see it. Mm-hmm. But what's way more fun is when you're out there in the trailer in the back country and you're in a $2,500 truck and you see some guy in his $200,000 rig. And yeah. Like, yeah. We're in the same spot. <laughs> yeah. 
It's one of the things I hate the most about off-roading the Lexus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the, we've said it for years at this point. Like the best off-roader is the one you care the least about. Like mm-hmm. Gambler was 100 proves it. Like wasn't 100%. that I remember Farah a long time ago saying like true luxury is not giving a fuck. Yes, it yeah. really is. That's like there's a part of me that wants to sell the Miata because it's cool, but like I gotta think about it in a way like this Tahoe like surfboard gets <laughs> chucked in there, you know, yeah. like the yeah. co- the cooler like you know we have not redone the drain and it just like all that melted ice just soaked into the floor oh, and I was, I was just oh, like no. I'm like, it just doesn't uh, matter at all. Like, oh no, it starts to smell bad. It's like, well, it's 20 years old. It's or, it's yeah, also it's also a good thing you're in California because here that would be a disaster. You'd yes. Freeze and then you'd start getting rust from underneath. And yeah. Christ. But, so, anyways, we are starting to brush up on time. So you've cool. done a bunch of Joshua Tree stuff. What yeah. uh what else? Anything you got your sights on for adventures for 23? I mean, 22 is like we're you know, in yeah, friggin' this. So because of the way my um because of the way I got into this, I w- I had never spent a night in a national park until last July. And again, now I've spent mm-hmm. some with like the press like rigs and then the LX. And so I kind of started a pretty high level of capability. And now I'm to the Tahoe, which like that trail I did in Joshua Tree, I couldn't do in the Tahoe, I'm pretty sure. Um, and, you know, it's also, it doesn't have an odometer. Uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, it leaks certain things. Um, the air conditioning doesn't seem to work, um, but the compressor does. So I don't know what the hell's going on. Send uh, me a message about that. Is it, Do you think it's the blend doors? Because I think it's the blend doors. Um, we'll have a conversation about that. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, but like, a big part of it is I don't know how to fix cars. So I'm trying to learn sort of in a low stakes way. And I mm-hmm. think GMT 800 is arguably the best platform in the world for that. Right. They only made millions of them. They only made millions of them. They only ever saw the hardest possible work. There's only 10,000 of them in your local junkyard. And every part <laughs> only costs $4. Um, this, you know, component of the AC duct switching system that I think is broken costs $40 on Amazon Prime. I love mm-hmm. it. It's, mm-hmm. it's two mm-hmm. screws get it out um but so yeah mostly i've been trying i've been trying to plan sort of local things um i'm also theoretically with a couple other gmt 800 guys thinking about trying to get to the north west tip of or sorry northeast tip of the labrador peninsula where yes. there's an inlet where you can supposedly see uh uh killer whales um mm-hmm. but i'm also trying to spend more time at home over the next year so <laughs> I, you know <laughs> isn't it funny how adventure does that you're like i need I, to go as far away as possible also just, I, need to, I need to just not go anywhere <laughs> yes um no yeah, so mostly what i'm trying to focus on for now is um yeah little i find i get if i do a week-long trip um i get a lot of stress about that because all of the things have to work together mm-hmm. but if i spend it one or two nights out there it's like the greatest catharsis in my life yeah. so a little more focus on things like you know a quick drive to zion and Camping on some chilled BLM land um, mm-hmm. is definitely in the cards for the winter. More, jo- I've been to Joshua Tree like seven or eight times since I've been out here, and just like oh. that's the spot. Um, so jealous. Yeah, and then there's a there's a beach that Wes Seiler recommended that's like two hours south of San Diego and Baja California, where you can camp on the beach and like it's sand, um, so you can awesome. drive all of it. So I've never really done much loose like that kind of stuff, like sand off roading. So. Those are the plans, but for now, I'm just trying to like. It's pretty good. I'm trying to build up my own hiking ability because what I really want to do is I want to do like you know I want to go to Zion and leave the truck and and go mm. backpack for two days in the backcountry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's uh, my, my wife just did Zion, so yeah, yeah. she loved uh, it. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So uh, base yourself out of Kanab. So Kanab ends up being like a four point. It's Kanab, Utah, and so okay. like Bryce is just north of you. Zion's yep. just west. North yeah. of the Grand Canyon is like an hour south and then Lake Powell's to the east of you. But uh, before you get yeah. there, it's um the Grand Staircase Escalante BLM land. So like Yeah, so we did what's it called? Um Bryce and Zion on our way out here, but I was in the Lexus loaded with literally everything else. Yeah. We were doing hotels. Um so I, I've been I and like 
I love Zion. I like Bryce even more, but we didn't stop his staircase. So yeah, I do want to loop around yeah. and hit them. Oh. There's just, the... It's so easy. There's so Staircase, many... thankfully, still around. Yes. Yep. <clears throat> By the skin of our teeth, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Plus one. Which is another part of it. Like, ultimately, if you're a big fan of the conservationist movement, like, eh. I, generally, <laughs> it's better if fewer places have giant trucks in them. But I, I do want to do that. Yeah. 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 That's it's, why it's, Trent Lightley's uh... a thing. Yeah. Sure that. It's, we, it's been... They were one of our first guests, actually. I'll uh, send Matt on email. We should, yeah, we should have that <laughs> have that conversation again. Reopen yeah. that, but yeah, uh, it's such a delicate balance between like going places and the, seeing things, and yeah, and right. also it, it does more for your personal environmentalism than anything else to just go out there oh, and see yeah. it. But yep. then your part, it's yeah, like anything else, it's morally mm-hmm. complicated. Just yeah, uh, take take kids just, and then just constantly be yelling at them about anything they touch. <laughs> don't touch anything yeah yeah it's just constant but like, also don't pick the flowers don't touch anything. clean up clean up after yourself that's uh yes. that's 101 yep well sweet um i'm gonna wrap up the show um do you, you have anything you want to plug mac anything that's coming out like um i don't know uh, what have you driven I lately guess, give us uh, like your your top three of the recent cars that have come through your you know, I have been driving. I've been like trying to ditch press cars more and more just because I've been enjoying my own stuff. Mm-hmm. We did P Cody, and I don't know how much I'm allowed, but um, you well, know, when do, when does a Corvette comes Z out that, tomorrow? So that comes out tomorrow. Okay. So no, no, we go Cor- out tomorrow. Oh, so don't oh mess yeah, up yeah. Not for a while. but I can say for sure. Uh, yeah, GR Corolla is awesome. Corvette Z06 is awesome. Uh, wow, oh, crap. What was the other the CTR other. allegedly awesome? I don't think I, I think technically the only drive impressions you're allowed to, I don't know, Honda's being weird about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've, we've heard. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, Matt's doing a great job educating us all on CTR issues. <laughs> 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 yeah, the fuckery yeah. that was that whole debacle, yeah. Yeah, and CTR is one of those cars, like, I'm ex- very excited for it to come out, and I, I, I'm a Honda guy, I would consider buying one, but I don't think the last one ever stopped being sold for a markup, and I just... Like I, oh, at some yeah. point, like I'm, I'm never gonna pay fifty grand for a Civic. So like, what are we? Like, who cares? Not here. Yeah, no yeah. way. Yeah. Um. But no, I don't really have anything to plug. Um. You know, read road and track for at least the good stuff if you can. Um, at least the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're all doing stuff. Uh, um, at least the good stuff. Okay. I, yeah, I'll plug. Um, reading. It's a good way. Uh, to learn stuff. Um, yeah. Mm. I've been going back into reading and less into informational video, and it's amazing how much more I remember. Um, and so, yeah, I think if we read more, we'd be a yep. little less yep. insane. Um, any uh, any good books? Oh, uh, throw some well, books out there. Uh, I just finished Sing and Unburied Sing by Jasmine Ward, which I really like, but that's not a, 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 the recommendation. The recommendation: um, <laughs> if you have not wet, read. Um, Arctic Dreams by Barry Lopez. If you are listening to, if you got this far in the podcast, you would like it. Um, He's a nature writer in the 70s who basically did um, all of the like things that are going on in the Arctic. Like he went and embedded with a fishing crew and a Mm -hmm. oil drilling crew crew and a bunch of Inuit tribes and a bunch of hunters and a bunch of biologists and just kind of learned everything there is to know about all the work going on in the Arctic. And built it into this like beautiful 600 page, like here is everything you need to know about, you know, uh, what's elephant seals. And here's Mm -hmm. all of the things that we know. And of course, as of the 70s, um, about Arctic (laughs) ice. Um, But he just, you know, casually drops all these anecdotes like, oh, well, I was flying over the Arctic Ocean and saw a horn. uh, What's the. uh, 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 Yeah, a bunch of. I, I. not a flock, but a pack of narwhals or whatever. It's a pod. over the ice. A pod. Yeah. Um, oh, a wait. gaggle. Just, yeah. yeah. It'll, it made me really, really want to. It's called it Arctic Heart. Dream. Dreams. Arctic Dreams by Barry okay. Lopez. Cool. It won all kinds um, of, it's one of the best nature writing books of all time. Adding um, to the good reads as we speak. Yes. Um, yeah. The way he talks about ice will make you like want to cry. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. So highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah. Well, see glacier is high on the list of things to do yes yeah sure. uh definitely get the glacier national park then yes because so, they're very shrinking soon. very fast yes. yeah yeah we, we, we saw need one to... when we went 
Yeah, I I was there not this summer, but the summer before last, and it was like they're all gone. <laughs> no. Yeah. Poor oh. planet. It's poor like, planet. Oh man, like all nature documentaries, we have started on a high note talking about how much we like everything and then <laughs> oh god, we're blowing it. Just sad. Oh yeah. yeah. Everything we do is making the planet worse. <laughs> yep. But if you want to lessen your impact, you know, if you like overlanding, try a backpacking trip. See what happens. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, sweet. Uh, you can rate and review the show on wherever you listen to podcasts. We're just about everywhere. Uh, mm-hmm. Spotify, Podcast places. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Mm-hmm. You can like and subscribe on YouTube. We will put the show up on YouTube as well. You can follow Mac. He's at Macklin Hogan on both of them, right? Twitter and Instagram. Yep. Um, yep. And then and you can follow Hooniverse, the right? Hooniverse on Twitter, the real Hooniverse on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ross is no, not like the one from Friends on Instagram. And <laughs> I'm at Overlanding Dad. And we've done it. Yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, well, thank you so for much for coming, Matt. It was nice yeah, to for sure. meet you virtually since yeah. we've only otherwise communicated virtually. Definitely. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, feel free to, um, I'd love to come back sometime, but otherwise hit me up if uh, oh, yeah. you ever got any things that are bringing you to San Diego. It's, I'll show you all the parts of Joshua Tree that I've discussed. Deal. And if you make it east, 